Hello and welcome to our session today titled Embedding a Culture of Compliance, Leading Insights from General Electric and Dell on Establishing an Effective Global Compliance Program. I'm Tom Hagee. I'm Managing Director with HB Litigation Conferences. This is part of a series we're doing called HB Compliance Conferences with Susan Frank Divers. I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, Mike McLaughlin is Vice President of Employment Law and Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer with Dell Incorporated. He leads the following global functions at Dell, employment law, employment litigation, ethics, compliance, privacy, and knowledge and assurance. Prior to joining Dell in 2000, Mike was at Roman Haas, now known as part of Dow Chemical Company, and Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. Joining Mike is Al Rosa, Chief Compliance Director for General Electric's Global Compliance Program, a function consisting of 800 compliance leaders He's responsible for company-wide processes including leadership engagement, risk assessment and abatement, open reporting, training and communications for General Electric's award-winning compliance program. In addition, he's also responsible for GE's Global Ombuds organization, which includes a network of 500 full and part-time leaders. He's a member of GE's Policy Compliance Review Board, GE's highest compliance council, and was past member of the executive team of the GE audit staff. A Six Sigma leader, Al is also the policy coordinator of GE's regulatory excellence risk area. In 2014, Al was the recipient of GE's Chairman's Award, GE's highest management award. Moderating the program today is Susan Frank Divers, who recently joined LRN Incorporated as senior advisor. LRN helps companies create compliant cultures through practical tools, education, and strategic advice. She was also executive director of the Business Ethics Leadership Alliance on behalf of Ethisphere. Ethisphere fosters compliant cultures around the world and compiles the highly respected world's most ethical companies list. Susan served as AECOM's assistant general counsel for global ethics and compliance and Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for more than five years. Under her leadership, the company's ethics and compliance program garnered six external awards in recognition of its effectiveness and Susan's thought leadership in the ethics field. In 2011, she received the AECOM CEO Award of Excellence, which recognized her work in advancing the company's ethics and compliance program. And now, here is Susan Frank Divers to moderate the program. Thanks, Tom, and thanks in particular, Mike and Al, for being our first panelists in this series. And I'm delighted that we've got a broad participation, um, judging from the number of people who have logged in. Um, and I want to thank Tom and Ethisphere, the because the purpose of this seminar, which is the first in a series of webinars, is to really broaden the dialogue in the ethics and compliance field. Um, to as many members of the legal community, the corporate community, and um, others who are interested and stakeholders in this area. And in that context, I'm really delighted to have Al Rosa and Mike McLaughlin, because in addition to being very distinguished chief ethics and compliance officers for companies that have gotten a lot of very well-deserved external recognition for their efforts, both Al and Mike are willing to invest their very limited time in public outreach in an effort to broaden the dialogue and to bring as many people as possible into a forum like this where we can share best practices and learn um, about how to craft an effective um, ethics and compliance program that also truly engages employees in values and in a sense of being stakeholders in their company's future. So with that, I'm going to start, if I may, with Al and ask Al to give a brief overview of GE's program and then I'll ask Mike to do the same. Okay. Al? Thank you, Susan. I think you actually have um at least I'm looking at Dell's page, so you might switch it to mine. Um, uh, I want to start by saying a warm thank you to the organizers of this event and those who are participating. I also want to stress that um, in describing GE's program, uh, one must understand that we are 
far from perfect, notwithstanding the accolades and awards we've won over the years. And um, it's from that, uh, accepting that proposition that I think it's so important that uh, we, GE, and others engage in uh, these sort of mutual discovery and learning sessions like the one being organized today. Um, because as a new profession, there's a lot to learn. I learn from uh, every exchange, and, uh, and this, is, this is no exception. Um, as you can see from our, um, our chart here, uh, the GE compliance program is um, one that uh, resides within the legal function. Um, I report directly to GE's general counsel, um, and the chief compliance officers in GE's operating units, and of course we are a conglomerate, uh, producing everything from credit cards to, um, to uh, power turbines, uh, rail cars, and so, so forth. Um, each uh, of our major operating units has a chief compliance officer, and they in turn report to their general counsel either within their business unit or at the country or regional level where we also have a significant team. Um, the team is uh, goodly sized, uh, one that we need given the scale and complexity of our enterprise. Um, we have 1,100 lawyers who um, participate uh, every day in our compliance program. Um, in the compliance operation, we have um, approximately 800 uh, leaders who have full-time responsibility for compliance. The majority of those uh, reside in our most heavily regulated businesses, uh, GE Capital, our financial services operation, healthcare, and uh, GE Aviation. But all of our businesses have strong uh, compliance resourcing. And I, I think the thing, the footnote I would drop there is that if you looked at the program just a, a decade ago, the number of compliance leaders in our organization could fit around a few, uh, a few good-sized meeting tables. Um, it's grown exponentially in size, which I think is a reflection of the environment, the regulatory and enforcement environment that we're all living in today. Um, I also personally have strategic responsibility for GE's so-called Ombuds program. Um, the program by which employees report concerns um, about our integrity uh, policies and regulation and law. And that's a group consisting of 500 mostly part-time leaders who are dedicated to promoting and um, receiving concerns from employees, logging and tracking those concerns and monitoring um, the concerns for closeout and, um, and effectiveness. Um, you know, I would say compliance at GE is effective in large part because it is operationally embedded in every function and every layer of the company across business, uh, across the globe, and each function. Um, and the way that we're organized is, I think, part of the keys to success within our organization. Uh, the first part of that organizational strategy is to understand that the, the role that the business and the corporate team play. And at GE, the businesses own the operational deployment of the compliance program. Um, for example, in our regulatory, uh, regula regulated, highly regulated businesses, um, the, the uh, chief compliance officers of those operations own the compliance programs that are specific to their industry. For example, Federal Aviation Administration, Food and Drug Administration, uh, Federal Reserve, et cetera, et cetera. And each program responds to the risks that apply based on those regulatory requirements and their specific operating environment. My team, the corporate team, supports those business operations by owning the policies, the procedures, the GE-wide initiatives, the company-wide initiatives that are cut across all of those operating units. Um, for example, our approach to improper payments must be consistent uh, and, uh, and effective wherever we do business in, in whatever uh, operating line, and a team of corporate so-called policy owners, one for each of our code of conduct policies, help to set those company-wide rules and keep employees on the common standard wherever they're doing business um, across the 165 countries where GE operates. And a similar dynamic occurs at the country level where our, where our global growth organization um, helps uh, teams to coordinate across business units. Um, although legal owns compliance, we have lots of assistance from other function 
Um, and I think the best example of that is in um, finance, where uh, they own the audit program that regularly assesses the health and the effectiveness of my compliance program across the, the globe. Finally, I would just note um, that strong governance is uh, critical to our effectiveness, um, including regular updates to GE's um, audit committee uh, of the board of directors, um, reviews by the corporate team of both the business and the country level compliance program, um, and then finally operating councils that occur at, at, uh, at business-led operating councils that are driven at the operating units and help uh, to establish that the, the programs are as effective as they must be. So let me pause there, Susan, and turn it, turn it back over to you. Thanks, Al. That's a very good overview of, of GE's program. And Tom, if you can go back to um, Mike's slides. Mike, would you mind giving us an overview of Dell's program as well? No, absolutely. Thanks so much. And, and uh, wanted to add my thanks for allowing Dell to be a part of this. Um, like Al, we believe that you learn from each other in compliance every single day. That this is a, um, a field where I think uh, doing well rises everyone's boats. So, so, so us exchanging ideas like this, sharing best practices uh, helps us all get better. So re really appreciate being a part of the program. So if you look at slide one, um, similar to Al, I, I report to the general counsel. I am in legal. Uh, if you look at Dell's compliance program, uh, picture a, kind of a hub and a spoke where we have the corporate center where our team sits, and then we have uh, on the spokes what we call a global compliance forum where each member of a compliance organization from the business sits on that forum, and there's great coordination between the center and, and all of those lines of business compliance programs. So we actually own uh, in our team, and it's in the very first bucket you see there, the key compliance programs. We own some of the programs that we think need to be nurtured in the center, um, and that would include uh, improper payments or anti-corruption, uh, privacy, um, uh, our third party program, and then Gibson Entertainment. And then because I also do employment law, we also own employment. So we own those five programs, and then we help coordinate through the Global Compliance Forum the other uh, 20 or so programs at Dell, including trade compliance, data protection, cyber uh, security, et cetera. And um, we also provide, in our group, we provide uh, legal support for those programs. So we have program owners for the five I mentioned, and then we also have legal support for those five as well as some of the others in, um, in the 20 uh, I mentioned earlier. So um, the thing that I, we also own investigations, um, which is we do all the internal investigations for the company um, and report the, the significant investigations to the board, as we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about governance. Um, but we have an investigation team that, that spans the globe and that does um, all the internal investigations that touch on compliance. Uh, like Al and at GE, we couldn't do the work we do without significant partnerships from organizations like the finance team, which includes audit. Um, we, we have a great partnership with audit. We do a lot of work with them. Um, they're, they're sometimes one of our best weapons in an investigation. Uh, sometimes when there are some issues that are broader, you can get an audit either of a third party or even internally at Dell that can give you a lot of information or investigations. And before I leave investigations, I want to talk about something that's important to us, and that is we have a saying at Dell that, that we turn findings from investigations into fixes. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't just solve the problem that's before us, but that we look at any control gaps or tone issues that we can address so that we solve the problem going forward and that we don't just face it again in another six months. So each of our major investigations has a remediation program attached to it. And that's where we partner very closely with audit um, and other parts of the business. Another great partner of ours is, is the HR team. Uh, you know, we have a team of about 15 investigators around the globe. Um, you know, we have a presence, significant presence in, in our major countries, the U.S., China, India, Brazil. Um, and then there are places where we don't have folks and, and language capabilities. So we look to the HR team, the business and the finance team to help us there and support us and, and other parts of legal. So we leverage our colleagues in legal as well in trying to get the investigation work done. Yeah. Critical to the investigation piece, and we're going to talk about best practices in a little bit, 
But, you know, we find that we learn the most from our own employees through the surveys we do and through specifically them speaking up to us. Um, we find that our investigation work works best when our employees are talking to us and they feel that they can speak to us and that things get done from the input they give us. So we have a big effort. We actually have video series and other things on trying to get our employees to speak up because we really want to hear from them. We want to make sure that if they see something, they say something. I think, I, I think I'm stealing that from the U.S. government's anti-terrorism pro, anti -terrorism program. Um, but then lastly, what I want to focus on before I talk about um, kind of structure and reporting relationships within the company is this strategic programs uh, office. You know, we're going to talk later about training awareness and, and the importance of making people really believe to their core that this stuff is important to them. All of our folks have so much that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. My own opinion, our biggest challenge is getting share of mind and making sure that people focus on what needs to be done here. And so we created an office that's specifically geared towards driving training and awareness across the company on these issues. We'll talk a bit about some of the more creative programs they've come up with. But th that's the part of the, I think, the part of the program um, that we spend a great deal of time on, making sure that we have the tone, making sure that we have the awareness, making sure that people, um, you know, we get that share of mind and that we, we talk about turning people who obey into people who believe and obey, right? We want both. We want people not to obey simply because we're watching. We want them to obey because they believe it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing for the company, it's the right thing for them, and it makes them proud. So we put a lot of emphasis into that, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But if you can switch to slide two, I can kind of talk through the governance structure. And as you see, uh, you know, we, have, we are a private company now, um, but we have a board of directors, and I report to that board just like Al spoke about earlier. We also have a Global Risk and Compliance Council, which I sit on and co-chair with our head of audit, and that has five of our um, highest members of the company. Uh, Mr. Dell sits on the, uh, the audit committee of the board, um, so we present to him in that respect. Um, but he has uh, seven direct reports around the globe, and, um, and five of them sit on this, uh, this Global Risk and Compliance Council. So we meet more frequently um, and have a lot of input from, from line management in that way. And then you can see the other various committees, similar to what Al said, you know, we really have a big regional focus at Dell, uh, and so we really have to tie in with our global colleagues. And then lastly, at the bottom, you'll see we started something. This was actually a very grassroots effort. Um, our Latin America team came up with this idea of an ethics task force where they wanted folks uh, to, to, to really come up with their own version of what we do in the center. Um, and so, so, for instance, they came up with a slogan, do the right thing, win the right way. Um, and, and you literally cannot walk a hallway in one of our Latin America facilities without seeing that sign. They have it on their badges, and they have buttons, and they have banners. And they came up with it all on their own, I mean, coordinating with us so the messages were consistent. But we thought that was a great idea to have something grassroots like that, so we actually ex exported it then to China, India, and, and our EMEA emerging group so that employees, um, th these are sales leaders, these are marketing leaders, these are folks who run the facilities. These people meet after work, because I've been a part of each of these meetings that when I travel around, they meet after their day jobs from six to seven, you know, on a, on a monthly basis or a biweekly basis and talk about how to improve their situation from an ethics and compliance standpoint. And it's one of the things we think that really gets people engaged and uh, walk the talk. So I'll um, stop there and um, uh, turn it back to you, Susan. Thanks, Mike. And one of the things that strikes me so strongly each time I'm privileged enough to hear about your program, Mike, or yours, Al, is how passionately committed you are to it, and also GE and Dell, uh, and that these are companies that genuinely want their employees engaged and genuinely want the employees to raise questions, issues, and concerns without any fear of retaliation. So I really commend you for that. Um, what I'd like to do now is let's go through the basic elements from the sentencing guidelines, which many years ago kicked off uh, the need for ethics and compliance programs, and just talk uh, basics again. Um, and I'd like Al to talk about executive commitment and involvement, and also policies and procedures. And then, Mike, I'll turn to you for communications and training and audit and assurance, even though you've both mentioned that a, a little bit, let's, let's pull those threads 
before we get into some of the innovative things that you're doing as well. So Al? So uh, Susan asked me to talk a bit about executive commitment and I, I'm going to spend the majority of my time here because I feel so passionately about it. Um, you know, I've been at this uh, effort in compliance, leading compliance programs for uh, a long time now and the thing that I've, the greatest lesson that I've learned over the years is that um, the culture at the end of the day is the primary influence on employee behavior. You know, you'll do a lot of tasks as a compliance leader from training to communications and so forth, but without a vibrant culture of integrity, those tasks um, have relatively little impact in, a, in value within the organization. Um, the thing that has the greatest impact on culture, I think we've seen at GE, is leadership. Um, employees from at all levels take their personal cues on behavior from the leaders and we believe that that's the case uh, at least in part because the leaders hold great sway over our employees from everything from salaries to uh, recognition to uh, promotions and so forth. Em employees are tuned in uh, in a in an focused way on what their leaders expect from them. And as a result of this, we spend a significant portion of our time in the compliance program on the concept of getting our leaders proactively engaged on compliance. And in fact, so much so that we think of leadership engagement as a process. You'll, I, I know that uh, others speak of uh, tone from the top and uh, you'll hear other phrases, message in the middle and so forth. But at GE, perhaps because of our engineering traditions, we think of important initiatives like getting our leaders engaged as a set of tasks that really have to be operationalized in order for the, uh, the program to be as effective as it must be. So what does it mean for leaders to be engaged? Well, in part, it is the notion that we want our leaders to, to participate directly, to do it, not delegate. That is, we have got to get them uh, to personally set the example for integrity. We need for them to make the tough calls on compliance and when it impacts their business strategy and to emphasize and, and teach employees that making the numbers, quote unquote, or satisfying a customer request can never come at the expense of our reputation. And when those calls, those judgment calls are made, it's a, it's a valuable teaching moment for the whole organization as to why, uh, why the leader has, has acted in the way that they have and what lessons employees should draw from it. Um, Fostering an open reporting environment, as Mike rightly said, is critical. Um, but unless the leader is personally and passionately involved in communicating that message, in reviewing the data, in extracting lessons from the employee, uh, the employee reports, my experience is that the, the, the program will have less effectiveness overall. Um, we look to leaders to incorporate regulatory and risk, compliance risk, into their business planning and operating models for the organization. Um, if they don't do so, then managers who report to them won't do it either. And we lose a critical, uh, a critical element of, of operating success. Um, next, we, we expect that leaders will act promptly when confronted with an issue. Um, you know, leaders at GE are judged from the moment they learn about a problem. We need, as uh, Mike described at Dell, systemic response, not just addressing the problem that has arisen, but looking systemically across the organization to ensure that the, 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 the process has been fundamentally fixed everywhere that it might arise, including when it, when it, when it uh, could arise in other businesses and other countries or regions around the world. Uh, leaders need to communicate about compliance with sincerity and conviction and about their uh, expectations. Uh, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to set goals and objectives for
for other leaders within the organization about what their priorities are and what needs to be achieved in the integrity program that year. Next, you know, one of the most powerful messages a leader can send is when resources, time, money, personnel are allocated to the integrity program. Um, every company around the world is stretched for resources and it speaks volumes when one of those precious resources, especially a senior resource, is allocated to work in the integrity program. Employees take a lesson from that about not just what leaders say is the priority, but what leaders express as a priority in the actions that they take. Uh, next, I would highlight um, the importance of holding managers accountable within their program. You know, Mike and I both go to uh, operating reviews on compliance and in those reviews we, we talk about the problems that have occurred. You know, it makes all the difference in the world if the leader looks to the business team, not the compliance leader, when mistakes arise. To, to understand what happened, what lessons they should take from it, and um, how to improve going forward. And I don't want to just emphasize the misses, but also the attaboys or the successes. When certain managers prioritize compliance and do well, um, avoid risk in a material way that it helps the reputation of the company, promoting that um, effort is extremely important. It all comes down, I would say, to this concept of engagement, getting the leaders to be personally engaged with their time, their resources, their commitment, their attention, um, their priorities. L if leaders are engaged, their employees will be engaged too. And if leaders are not engaged, the other things that you do will have much less impact and eff effectiveness. Now at GE, we reinforce these lessons through in-person leadership training. We spend a lot of time not just setting expectations for leaders, but teaching them how to to operate these processes, um, giving them examples both positive and negative from other leaders, you know, where we've made mistakes um, and also where we've had successes in this area. And when we have global meetings um, at every level of the company, we take time to talk about compliance, both the regulatory environment, the CEO's expectation for their the global team around compliance and uh, and what the notion that it's a one strike and you're out environment. Now, uh, Susan also asked me to touch on policies and procedures. You know, one can spend hours on, on this area. I would say that the, the thing that I would like to, to stress is that in building a culture, um, one has to really spend a lot of time thinking about how employees are absorbing the myriad policies and procedures and requirements that they are subject to. Um, GE has embarked on a, a campaign that we call simplification and one of the big lessons learned from that effort is that um, less oftentimes is more. That is, simpler compliance is more effective compliance. And this applies um, uh, in, in, in no other greater way than in policies and procedures. For example, we've taken an effort to streamline our global code of conduct, to digitize it, to get it down to the bare minimum of, um, of words and uh, volume that really help to express what's expected of the employees. And we've used digital tools to layer in uh, videos, online training, games and such that help employees reinforce what they're learning without having to click through multiple systems and processes and tools. I think this concept of simplification is the, the next frontier for compliance, not only as it impacts policies and procedures, but globally across the program, including training, communications, um, operating reviews, and, and the like. So let me pause there and turn it back over to Susan for the next question. Al, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm struck by how much effort and priority and how multi-layered the messaging is at GE and the commitment um, that, that ethics and compliance are absolutely integral to the culture. And also thanks for the point about simplification. 
for many companies with multinational workforces, um, many of those employees don't have English as their first language. So simplification makes a, a good deal of sense in terms of getting the message out. Um, I'd like to turn to Mike now um, to talk about communications and training, something he's touched on a little bit, and also audit and assurance, um, which is a very robust function, as he mentioned, at Dell. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, no, great, Susan. And if you could turn to my third slide then, and it's moving from obeying to believing. Um, but, but first, let me just say to everything Al said, I say ditto. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I could not agree more about the critical criticality of having leaders who not only talk the talk but, but walk the walk. You know, we did a culture survey. We, we do a, a, a culture survey solely on ethics and compliance, um, and we're, we're about to do another one um, coming up in the next month. But we do a corporate survey uh, called Tell Dell, and um, this year we added a culture component. And uh, the survey goes out to all 100,000 or so employees, and we got almost 70,000 responses, so really good data. And uh, the culture survey has a lot of questions, but one of them was, what cultural attribute do you most identify with the company and do you see most at the company? And I'm proud to say the number one answer was ethics and integrity. It, got, um, it, it beat out everything else, as you know, including customer focused, winning, all the things that are critically important to our company, obviously. But ethics and integrity was the number one thing people said they see. And so, you know, starting with Mr. Dell on down, um, you know, I think leaders both have to act in that way and they have to show their commitment to engagement, as Al was saying. So that, that gets me to a slide here about, you know, from obeying to believing, you know, we truly believe that the keys to the kingdom in ethics and compliance is getting employees who act like owners, who, who act like, you know, a Michael Dell would act when faced with a decision. And, um, you know, not just look at the short-term game for the individual employee or uh, for their bank accounts, but to look for what's best for the company and what's best for the communities in which we serve and to take a long-term approach and to do the right thing. So all of what you're going to see in the next couple pages are really geared towards this goal of moving people to, to the far right, upper right, where they don't just comply because we're watching, but they comply because they really believe it's the... Uh, right thing to do. And if you, if you move to the next slide, there's just a, a little bit more about this idea of culture of believers. There, there's a quote uh, I read in a book once. Um, I used to quote it on here and it, it get the attribution. But it basically is that, you know, that conventional wisdom is that to get people to do something, you got to show what's in it for them, you know, the with them. But conventional wisdom really is wrong. If you want to get people to do the right thing here, you've got to show them that they're serving a higher purpose, that they're doing something bigger than themselves and that it's more important than just what their own self-interest is. And I totally believe that. I'm a trial lawyer by trade. I still actually do employment litigation. I uh, just did a mediation the other day. And so um, I, um, I, I believe that when you, uh, when you try and convince a jury of something, um, you are trying to win both their minds and their hearts. And I believe that's the same with our employee base. Um, and through all the things that Al talked about with leaders, They've got to be a part of the program. And if you move to my next slide, we kind of get specific on some of the things. And a lot of it is about training and awareness. Um, as I said earlier, we have an organization dedicated to coming up with ideas on training and awareness. And so we try and be simple, as, as Al suggested. I really think if you're going to get and keep this share of mind, you've got to really show um, the workforce and especially leadership that you're going to be very efficient very simple, that it's going to be something that they can really use in their everyday jobs. And there's a couple principles that fall into some of these act activities that I'll talk about in a minute. One of them is, you know, it's got to be relevant and it's got to work with the business. It can't be something esoteric. It can't be something academic. It's got to be relevant and practical for them, solutions-based. But, but number two is I, I'm a big believer in the power of stories. I think what we do benefits greatly from the power of stories. There's, there's a famous quote that Stories put children to bed and send soldiers to war. And I believe that. And we try and leverage stories at Dell. So we try and do it in our training. We try and make sure that we have, we even have decks we call stories decks, right? So we have our cases, cases we've heard in the industry, and we put the context of the rules around these stories so people remember them. And we let leaders actually tell the stories. So we have these stories decks on a topic on privacy, any corruption, trade compliance, whatever you want to pick, and we can give them a leader so that they can tell a story as they talk to their team about it. 
Um, and of course, we, we expect leaders to do that. Um, we, we, we also yeah, actually tell stories um, about Mike, our own cases. So we, Mike, sorry, we, we sorry actually, to interrupt. I just want to make sure I'm on the right slide for you. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's now on slide five of mine. Is that, are you looking at it? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, no, no worries. Um, so um, we, we actually tell about our cases, and, and there's pluses and minuses to doing this, but we've decided that it's important enough that we do it. So we actually, once a quarter, I send a note called Don't Let This Happen to You to all employees that talks about cases. I try to anonymize it, of course, for privacy purposes, but we want people to know. And we do that because when we do an ethics survey, as the CELE, CLC survey that we do, and we're going to be doing soon again, you know, when the response about do you speak up comes out, and there are some people who say they don't, the number one reason is because nothing ever happens when you do. And so we want them to know that things do happen. And again, protecting privacy, but we go out there with our, with our actual cases and talk about them and this don't let uh, happen to you. We, we, we also um, try and leverage, as Al was suggesting, uh, kind of more creative things like videos. We actually use humor in trying to get the message across because we think humor is memorable. When we first talked about humor, one of the members of the board was like, do you think that people will think that we're kind of trivializing these very important issues? And my response was, we're actually fortunate to work with a gentleman named Chuck DeRoss. Chuck ran the uh, anti-corruption program for the U.S. government uh, for five years before he uh, left uh, the government in January of last year. And he was in uh, law enforcement for many years before that. Um, and so Chuck actually works at a law firm now, and he works with us, and we've done videos together. Chuck and I did videos on uh, critical topics like third-party compliance programs, et cetera. But I asked Chuck, I said, you know, well, how does the government look at it using humor and videos and things of that nature? They look at it as trivializing these important topics or not? And his response, and I think this is the right response, is they want you to use the most effective thing to make people remember it so that when they're about to make a decision, and they're about to cut a corner, or they're about to do something that's expedient and not in the best interest of the company, that they'll remember. Now, the last thing I'll say, um, and, and there's a bunch of programs here. We can talk a little bit more about this slide uh, when we get into best practices. But the last thing I'll say in terms of you know, m make it personal, make it real to people. Uh, some of you may be aware that yesterday there was a, a, a memo published by the Department of Justice uh, here in the United States. Uh, it's now being referred to as the Yates Memo. Uh, its author uh, was former, uh, I think, U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney in Atlanta. Um, and she uh, makes it very clear, and Chuck has made this very clear to us, the, government, the United States government is looking to go after people more and more. They're looking to go after people. They're looking to put people who do wrong things, they're looking to hold them accountable. And so, you know, we really, without scaring or being, you know, the, the fright police, We've really got to make it very clear to people that there's a personal involvement and that doing the right thing is your only ticket out of uh, trouble like that. And that leads me to the last slide we have is, is on accountability. So the essence is to address this. You know, we look at it as lines of defense, right? Obviously, the business is the first line of defense. Um, we're one of the other assurance providers, my, my team. And then finally, we have the audit team and, of course, external auditors as well. So we look at it, whether you're talking about infrastructure and IT risk or whether you're talking about what we deal in regulatory and compliance risk, um, we really look at it in terms of lines of defense. And, and we rely on our audit team and on our team to hold people accountable by presenting the uh, evidence to the, to the business. And just like Al said, the business makes a decision. Leaders in this company make decisions to terminate folks' employment. Leaders in this company make decisions to um, address people in a, in a way to make them accountable and fix their conduct and behavior. So we present it, they decide, but at the right level, right? At the right level so you get the right decision. And I reserve the right always to go all the way up to the board if it's not the right decision, but that, that hasn't happened yet. So I'll turn it back over to Susan with that. Thanks, Mike. Um, and hey, I Susan? Everybody. <laughs> Susan, I, I apologize. I'm having, we're having some technical difficulty, and I don't think we're on the right slide. Uh, the one I'm on now is still back to the obeying, the believing. What slide should we be going to at this moment? Hey, hey Tom, I think if you go to GE slides, because I'm going to ask Al to talk about best practices, and, and no worries. Okay. I apologize to the audience for the confusion. We're going to straighten it up, and we'll get you the deck and the recording when we're done here. So I'm now going to 
Uh, which slide again? I'm sorry, Susan. To the. Um, uh, if you go to the GE slides, and then Al can give you um, particular um, instructions, because I know he's going to talk about um, some of his open reporting efforts. Okay. Sorry. So I'll go back to GE. Apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, and and um, I was just going to say I would urge everybody. Uh, we made available Mike's article that appeared in Ethosphere called "Targeting Hearts to Win a Share of Minds." And Mike, I just reread it, and it's really excellent. It's a good blueprint for how to move from a culture of rules to a culture of values, and that's something we were talking about at LRN yesterday at a meeting in New York, and it's something um, the government clearly believes in as well. So with that, let me turn it back to Al to talk about some of the best practices and cutting edge initiatives that GE is undertaking. And then we'll hear from Mike and then we'll wrap up. Al? Great. Um, so Susan asked me to talk a bit about open reporting, um, which is a subject that I feel uh, passionately about. And I, I um, inherited a tradition when I joined the uh, the compliance team here I inherited a tradition of um, of commitment to the open reporting program um, at GE the ombuds program has been established since the uh, early to mid 90s um, and there has been a deep um, and abiding commitment to understanding what employees are are observing in their operating environments and promoting um, the notion that they should step forward and report what they see without fear of retaliation. Um, earlier I spoke about the power of culture uh, and my belief that it is uh, the, the single most important influence on behavior. And uh, what follows from that belief I think then is if you want to know about the effectiveness of your culture, if you, whether or not you have a healthy culture, this question about open reporting and the the willingness of employees to come forward and actually report what they see, in my mind, is the best indication about whether the culture that you want to have and you aspire to have is actually in place. And this, of course, must be done um, by, by reference to operating units, countries, um, uh, P&Ls, etc. There's not just one culture in, in the organization, there are many. And the degree to which employees are reporting throughout the, the organization is, a, is an extremely useful measure. Now, in, in saying this, I have to, to observe that, you know, paradoxically, I think that more concerns is a, is a good thing. And that's because, you know, despite best efforts, even at a company like Dell, which clearly, um, clearly invests at the, at the highest level, it's, it's true that no compliance program is perfect. You will always have issues, including serious ones. But if your culture is working well, employees will come forward to raise those concerns. Um, as I mentioned, at GE we invest heavily in open reporting from the perspective of resources. We've got 500 uh, part-time, largely, employees who promote the system locally. We uh, try to have those employees based in every business, in every country where, where we do business. We focus on the gender mix to ensure that um, people feel comfortable reporting. We make um, many channels available uh, for employees to report concerns, including human resources, compliance, legal, audit, an anonymous helpline, um, and you, you name it. Um, employees can, can find the place to report. And the, the team that's charged with overseeing this program has a number of responsibilities, including maintaining those channels, monitoring to ensure the timeliness of investigations, ensuring prompt, impartial, and thorough reviews of concerns that are raised, of course, in uh, communicating and monitoring for a retaliation-free environment. Um, we centrally track every concern. Um, in 2014, um, we had more than 3,300 concerns in our system. We centrally monitored and tracked each one of those to ensure that we're doing, doing the right thing. Um, like Mike, we um, are very focused on response. When we see an issue, we too invest in a, um, a real compliance story series in which we 
talk candidly about the reasons that a particular compliance violation occurred and how we are acting um, to ensure that that doesn't occur. A critical part of all of this is what I'll call organizational justice. Employees have to feel like um, that there will be discipline at every level of the organization and that managers in particular are going to be held to a higher standard because it is they, after all, who own the program. Now, um, in one of the things that one learns when you're operating um, a, a program of this, in, of this level of importance is that you can never rest on your laurels. You could never believe that every employee feels safe in coming forward. And therefore, we spend a lot of time in what I'll call continuous improvement. Um, one of the things that we do is we look carefully at survey data. And a few years back, one of the observations that we made by taking internal surveys is that the data showed that uh, employees who actually observed misconduct only reported that misconduct to, ma to our ombuds line um, a, in a small fraction of cases. And they said that what they, they, their typical approach was to go to managers um, to report concerns. And that's a good thing, I think. If employees trust their managers and believe that they're prioritizing integrity, it's great that they go first to the managers. But we, um, at the time, were not, were not um, uh, tracking, as a rule, all of those manager-reported concerns. And so we broadened what had up to that point been, been called the ombud system to what we now call the open reporting system. We trained over 28,000 managers um, on how to recognize an integrity concern when it was reported to them, what channel they, the integrity uh, concern should be reported to, um, how they should uh, ensure that the employee understands that the investigation will be confidential and retaliation free. We gave them an overview of um, the investigation process so they could explain that to the employees. And we saw a significant, significant, significant uptick in the number of concerns that we, that, uh, we received as a result of this initiative. So that, that was improvement number one. Um, and uh, the reason that we now call our program open reporting versus ombuds. Secondly, something that we're doing now um, is what I'll call data analytics. Um, we've recognized that this um, stream of concerns provides invaluable data, not only about the types of issues employees are concerned with, but it also allows us to um, identify and mine the root causes of each of these issues. Um, so we're taking time now to attach standardized root causes to each of the concerns so that we can learn about the defective process that occurred that, or, or gave rise to the, the issue at hand. And when you do that over uh, thousands of cases, what you can uh, learn from are the trends. So for example, it might be that you, you have ineffective training um, in a specific area and that confusion about the rules is giving rise to issues or that your control is not as effective as it ought to be and that by fixing the control you can actually reduce the number of concerns that you receive and, and address the underlying problem. Or perhaps there's intentional misconduct uh, that, is, that is promoted by uh, the wrong priorities being sent, uh, uh, making the numbers um, uh, mindset without reference to integrity. And in that case there too if we see a trend in a specific business or region we can address that as well. So uh, data analytics um, is, I think, the wave of the future here, at least for GE, and something that uh, we'd be happy to, to talk about on a future call. So back over to you, Susan. Thanks, Al. Um, and because time's starting to get a little bit short, I want to turn it over to Mike right away to also talk about some of the innovative programs at Dell. Uh, and then if we've got time, um, we've got a question that's come in, um, Mike, for you that uh, asks if you can describe how your recognition program, How I Win, works at Dell. So Mike? Yeah, that's, that's great. And I'll start with that. Um, it's actually a program that we uh, recently started. Um, we had uh, a couple folks who have come forward and told us about issues that we were able to investigate and remediate. We thought they deserved an award, and that, that became kind of anecdotal. We would give them awards. Uh, we actually have an award system at Dell, and we were able to do that. Um, and then we decided to make it more of a grassroots issue. So we, we're actually launching now this idea about recognition. And it's not the, the monetary piece of this. I mean, we, 
we actually uh, had a discussion about, you know, the, 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 the Dodd-Frank actually has some monetary component that the government offers folks, as you know, to come forward. And companies, I think, have discussed whether they uh, want to do a monetary component. We've decided not to do that broadly. But we have given awards for people who have courage to speak up, especially when it you know, was about their peers or other folks that made it particularly difficult. And so now we're having a program that doesn't have a monetary piece, but it's basically you get badges. We leverage technology a lot in our company, obviously, given what we do. So for instance, we're on chatter a lot and other things of that nature. You can actually give a badge, an integrity badge for folks you know, on chatter. You can have it uh, on your email. We're coming up with logos and whatnot so that you can just recognize fellow employees for doing the right thing. Um, but, but but in terms of best practices, just I'll be brief. I'll just take two minutes here. Um, you know, absolutely agree on the data analytics piece. I mean, imagine five years from now in our profession when you are able to triangulate things like you know a vendor's name and travel expense statements and your employee population and blank 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 to try and figure out. We're not looking at data analytics as a way to pin something on someone like that movie Minority Report where you, you can get arrested just because you're thinking of a crime. That's never going to happen. But what we can really do is focus. We can focus training where we see data analytics leading us. That's the promise to, to, to us of data analytics. You could actually see if you triangulate all of these things, you can see, you know what, instead of training 10,000 people on this issue of anti-corruption or gifts and entertainment, this data points me to these 70 people who, because of what they spend and where they live and who they work with and all these other things, they could really benefit from a two-hour course instead of a you know, half an hour course that you give to 10,000 people. Let's deep dive with these folks because data tells us that they're the biggest risk to us. So really excited about data analytics. The other thing I'll say about gamification, we haven't talked a lot about it. You could spend the whole, I think, course on it. We're really excited. Right now, um, we have two, and we're about to have three games. So our compliance training that you do, um, it is going to be virtually completely game-based. Uh, we, we actually last year piloted our first game. We had It was voluntary. We had 25,000 of our 100,000 employees take it, and we had a 94% approval rating. So in fact, people were a competitive culture. People took it twice or three times to try and get a better score. So that was on anti-corruption. We now have the anti-corruption one again and privacy, and then next year we'll have an additional one. And the last thing I'll say about training that, that I think is, a, is, is kind of a best practice is we actually have developed a course for sales makers. You know, we have 20,000 of them or so around the globe. But we've developed a course with our sales trainers. So uh, this is not a compliance course. This is a sales course that embeds compliance in it. It actually speaks to the sales makers in sales maker language and is delivered with, by our team in partnership with the sales training team. So when salespeople now learn how to sell Dell, they learn how to sell our, our, our solutions, um, they're going to learn in that exact same language how to do it in the right way. So we're excited. We're focused on sales for the next year and a half until we get these 20,000 trained in this program. It's called Leading from the Front. And then we'll move on to another group, probably marketing folks or finance folks. But it's not traditional compliance training. It's their training, but with our stuff embedded inside of it. So I'll, I'll stop there in the interest of time and turn it back to you, Susan. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. And thanks, Al. Um, again, um, it, it, maybe three years ago, people talked about some companies had checked the box compliance and ethics programs. And um, what the two of you have described is, is so far beyond that that um, it's really phenomenal. Um, and uh, in particular, talking about going well beyond the hotline as any kind of indicator of the company's health in this area. Al with open reporting um, and Mike, some of the things you talked about with data analytics. Um, clearly, you and your companies are committed um, to finding out what are the concerns, what are the issues, what are the problems, and equally important, if not more, fixing them. So I really want to thank you for taking the time. And as I said before, um, you're both people who are willing uh, to externalize a lot of the lessons you've learned and the insights you've gained. And we really appreciate that. And I want to thank um, both HB conferences, um, Tom and the, the series we're doing, and Ethisphere, which has really uh, committed to helping companies share best practices uh, through the world's most ethical companies 
program and also through sponsoring webinars with the, like this. So I hope you'll um, join us for future webinars. And I wish everybody a great day. With that, I uh, you know thanks uh, Mike very much, uh, Mike from Mike McLaughlin from Dell, Al Al Rosa from General Electric. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very much. And Susan, it's always a pleasure to work with you. Thanks for pulling together this great panel. I thought it was an excellent session. Look forward to seeing everybody again. With that, uh, I'm going to conclude today's webinar, and I hope to see you on another one in the future. Thank you. <laughs>